Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Rosanna Deerchild's poetry collection, This is a Small Northern Town. So, um, Deerchild is a, is a member of the Cree Nation from South Indian Lake, Manitoba. So that, I mean, that, I know that from the little bio on the back here. So that's one of the sort of central themes of this play is the experience of growing up as a First Nations Canadian in a small in a small town in northern Canada. And so these are the two sort of central concerns. Um, this experience of particularly being an indigenous woman, being being indigenous um, and small town life. But the other sort of interesting theme is cultural hybridity and this sort of halfway position because the speaker of the the poems um, and i don't know how how autobiographical this is but the speaker of the poems um has an indigenous mother who's married to a white seemingly mormon uh man who's not who's not uh, the speaker's father is the stepfather and that's actually really interesting because one of the big issues in terms of indigenous rights in Canada has revolved around the status of indigenous women who marry white men because for a long time under the sort of racist um, Indian Act laws in Canada um, First Nations women, people, women who, who were officially recognized as members of First Nations communities could lose their status as members of First Nations communities if they married non-Indigenous men. So that's actually a, a big political concern in, in Canadian history. And this collection doesn't really deal with that, but it deals with a lot of other issues for uh, particularly for people who are in these sort of border spaces where they're sort of um, they're in maybe white majority communities or things like this um, but they are themselves indigenous people and and actually we we have a, a sequence of poems a, a very interesting dynamic sequence of poems revolving around baptism and ceremonies um <clears throat> because and actually i think one of the poems uh yeah one of the poems uh that i wanted to read for you called dreaming dress is part of this sort of sequence of poems about baptism in into the mormon faith and this sort of alien experience of this from the perspective of <clears throat> of the speaker who again is is Cree um, this is not the most overtly sort of hybrid <clears throat> I'm between two worlds kind of poem but it, it, it definitely takes us there and I think it's a beautiful poem uh, so it's called dreaming dress Mama chooses clean white cotton the symbol of purity to her husband's people these Mormons and their rituals her baby girl reborn at the age of eight, what sin would she know Mama can't imagine? Her people's ceremonies, residential school made sure of that. But she creates one in the shape of a dress for her daughter, calling, calls it a dreaming dress. The fine white cotton camouflages eggshell flowers, elaborate, bold, like the wildflowers that find their way into jars, cups, books all over the house sings Cree lullabies into every stitch, whispers prayers along the red and white ribbon circling its hem, a medicine wheel, Mama remembers this one thing from her kokum. That means grandmother, by the way. The church may claim her daughter's soul, but her spirit will always be tied to the earth. Mama makes a dreaming dress, her decision to not lose me in the water, resolute as her stitches. So we do get <clears throat> we do get some of that sort of betweenness of cultural hybridity. Um, again, it's not developed as overtly as in some of the poems. Um, <clears throat> but again, we have this sort of these these different cultural elements embodied in the physicality of the dress, the 
the white cotton material chosen for its symbolism to Mormons, the design, the flowers, the medicine wheel design, <clears throat> chosen because they're significant to First Nations Canadian peoples. So that's one of the, the things. We've also got... <clears throat> We've also got some poems that are more sort of overtly about the violence or the cultural denigration of First Nations people in Canada. Um, and so one of those we get with Cousin Comes In From The Bush. Still half cut from all night partying, my cousin wakes me at 7 a.m. And she meets, which means little sister. He says in slurred Cree, let's go for breakfast. His name is boy who is always smiling. His name is laughter in my heart. His name is always holds my hand. I wear my dawn yellow sundress. On the corner, a bright yellow Corvette stingray slows to a stop. My cousin staggers to a standstill, yells, now how in the hell do you, do you haul wood in something like that? Our laughter echoes off Sunday morning like the sun glinting off its chrome hubcaps. Then, as if one fell off, clattered loudly down the street, Mr. Stingray screams, Dirty Indian, go home. Suddenly, I see my cousin's ripped shirt, beer spilled down the front of his northern store jeans, his dark brown skin a stain on this scrubbed white mining town. My shame matches up with the revving engine of a speeding away Stingray. So, we've got those, again, sort of dynamic components here. Um, and this, this sense that in this town in, in northern Manitoba, which would have been traditional uh, Cree land, that they are somehow the outsiders. This, this family of indigenous people is somehow the outsiders. So it's, it's a very interesting tension there. We also get... Um, We also get a lot of sense of like trying to escape this town, trying to escape a Canada really dominated by white settler culture, um, trying to escape poverty, trying to escape inequality, things like this. So these are really sort of central themes as well. And also trying to escape this small town, because there are there are several poems about the kind of people who choose to stay in this town. Um, but the speaker of these poems is not really one of them. This is someone who, like, there's a lot of poems about her, her trying to escape to the wilderness, trying to escape to the woods. Refusing to wear shoes is a theme that comes up in a number. Um, feeling more comfortable in the forest, feeling more comfortable uh, in the stream and things like this. So this theme of escape, of, of not feeling uh, connected, not feeling like you belong, is really central here. And we get this, I think, in, a, in this great poem called This Flight Tonight. Um, and there's a character who's introduced called Lola. Um, and, and she's introduced in a number of poems. And she becomes the sort of best friend of this, of this speaker. So it's This Flight Tonight. I steal a bottle of Crown Royal from a full-on party, lay with Lola on the roof, escape this hot August night, the golden liquid a burst of fire in my throat, but we pass the bottle between us, drink until flushed, our, thun our, our tongues thick, fat words slide out, our rigid bodies loosen, Lola says, the sky is falling, and we laugh loud, unrepentant. Nazareth buzzes in our heads, an electric mosaic of stars hum along our limbs. The moon is a half-closed eye, drunk, unfocused. Lola and me talk about what we'll do when we get out of here. I tell her I'm never coming back. Lola says, take me with you, and I say, of course. And it's all possible, because the stars are close enough to grab. I think it's a beautiful sentiment that that poem ends on. Um, and again, this this sort of sense of wanting to get away, of seeking freedom, and that that freedom is somehow linked to the natural world. That that freedom is somehow linked to the universe as a whole. It's, I think it's very, very uh, 
consistent with indigenous ethics and this idea of indigenous resurgence that a lot of First Nations um, activists, thinkers, scholars um, ha have written about extensively. Um, this idea that the way that indigenous peoples can return to, or the way that, that indigenous peoples can sort of reassert them themselves as nations, reassert themselves as legitimate cultures, is by returning to their traditional ethics. 